If, you, if you'd like to turn to someone on your right or on your left and just say, good evening, I hope the Lord blesses you this evening, if you would, please. Great stuff. I just sort of do that because I'm too tired of people coming in and saying, nobody ever talks to me in church, so now someone has. All right, there you go. Great. Now, we're going to have a look at, at the Lord, Lord's Prayer. We're going, to start at the, we're going to start at the beginning, but I just want to have a quick recap on what we looked at last time. Just in a, very, in a quick nutshell, it, we've seen that it, was, it, it must be realized that the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray can be meaningless phrases, empty mumbo-jumbo when motivation is mindless repetition without thought for either the words uh, that are said or its destination. In fact, uh, before, uh, as, as Tim read out, uh, thank you, Tim, for reading, it, uh, it, you know, it says, don't, don't go into vain repetition or many words. You know, you often see them, the people of other faiths, and we're not here to knock faiths, we're not here to condemn faiths, but some people think by, by, by repetition of a word, a mantra, or whatever, somehow they'll break through, or somehow by repeating a special name over and over and over, they'll break through, or sometimes by repeating the same phrase. I've heard Christians will just get into sometimes repetition. They'll, they, they think some, somehow they'll break through, and Christ himself said, even in his day, he said, don't get on like, like the pagans, the Gentiles, who give for vain repetition, many words. You know, that is, you know, we would say a mindless mumbo-jumbo. And I don't want uh, to break anything down. But if I've, if, I, if, one, if I've learned one thing about the Lord's Prayer, it's this. Many Christians can say it without even thinking about it. And if you're not thinking about it, then are you, you're not concentrating on what you're saying. You're just... And it comes. It's just mindless words that are just flowing out without even concentrating on what you're saying. So we have to be careful. <clears throat> and we looked at last time that it shouldn't be called the Lord's Prayer because it wasn't really the Lord's Prayer. He taught the disciples to pray it. So in one sense, we could call it the disciples' prayer or the family prayer. Um, in fact, prayer was the only thing that the disciples asked to be taught. They didn't. They weren't. They didn't ask Lord teachers to preach or to cast out the demons or to heal the sick. In fact, Christ they said, just go, go and do it in my name. And they went and did it in, the, in his name. But it's funny enough that the only thing that were, that's recorded that they asked to be taught was prayer. And I believe it's because Christ's life, his prayer life was so radically different to all the other people that it, was, it drew them like a magnet. There's something different about his prayer, prayer life that they wanted to know how to pray like he prayed. Uh, and it would be, I, I don't know about you. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I like to pray. I do a lot of praying. Uh, I can't get people praying enough, but I don't find prayer easy sometimes. Do you? I don't find prayer easy sometimes. It's a real battle sometimes. It's funny how you, when it comes to prayer, prayer's a bit like church. Coming to church and coming to prayer, especially prayer meetings, you, all of a sudden you've got 101 things you must do around that time that you should be praying. It's interesting, I find. Um, although, you know, when I'm going to watch a, fo a, 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 a football match, I never have 101 things I should be doing. I'm going to watch a sport game or a film or I'm going out for a meal. I never think of all these things that encroach on my time. But when it comes to prayer, all of a sudden we, we get the list out because they all seem to hit each one of us. But prayer is something that's vital, that's crucial, and the disciples asked to pray. But if, if the prayer is used in the way that it was taught or demonstrated, it can, it can open up avenues of such intimacy, power, and contentment. I, don't, I bet you never thought about the Lord's Prayer like that before. If it's used right, I believe it is such a... It can open up many, many avenues of intimacy. That's, that's never a word I thought I would use when we talk about the Lord's Prayer because we just say it. We never connect with the, with the person we pray to, the power that's behind it and the contentment that, that we can have in, in praying to the God who we're taught to pray to. So prayer is to God and for His glory. It's not for us. It's not for us to get our shopping list out. This is the sort of things we looked at last time, similar things. Prayer can be learned. Prayer can be learned. And if, you're, if, if you feel you can't pray, align yourself with someone who you think can pray. 
You notice I said, who you think, you think they can pray. I'm not, I've yet to come across someone who will volunteer and say, I'm the best prayer in the world. I think we all have battles in that area. But if you cannot pray, or you think you cannot pray, or if someone has spoken over your life and said, you shouldn't pray, rebuke it in the name of Christ, kick it out, link yourself up with someone who does pray, and pray. It's a thing that can be learned. And it's the one thing we never teach in church. And so prayer is both a personal and corporate thing that we will look at um, to, uh, today. So we're going to look uh, t- tonight. So we're going to look at the, the, very, uh, the, very, the very, very beginning. So we could start at the beginning. Our Father in heaven, or our f- 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 Father who art in heaven, if you like King James. We're going to start there. I think it's very important. If you get the foundation right, the rest of it falls into place. If you don't get the foundation right, the building will not be as secure because we'll, be we'll be leaning in one way or another. Uh, and I think it's very, uh, very important we get the foundation right. It would appear that from the Lord, from the form of the Lord's Prayer uh, in Matthew, that it opens v- very, very much in the Aramaic liturgical style, something they probably would have said in synagogue, or it would have been re- uh, repeated in Aramaic, it, it, uh, and which was known as the Kadesh, if you're in that sort of, if you really want to know. That's what it was known as, the, the Kadesh. The simple address, Father, corresponds in, f- in, in the form Abba. Not the group, okay, in case you're wondering. Abba. Now, Abba was a great was a great little name, and we'll get into that in a minute. But Abba is, is which he used himself. Christ used himself. Uh, and which the early Christians followed his example. And we read about that in Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6, where, the, where the, the early Christians, the first Christians, the first century Christians, prayed Abba. Abba Father. What a wonderful name. I'm sure you know very well, because I know Tim and I know Bob will have taught this so very clearly, that Abba was that wonderful intimate phrase, that little first cry of a child, Daddy or, or Dada or Dad, that real thing that melts your heart because you think, oh, they called my name, you know, and then they grow up and then you, and then, 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 then you want them to be quiet. You know, but that wonderful thing of, of they cry, Daddy, you know, that child's cry of daddy. That's what Abba really is. That's that intimate, so close cry. And that's, that's the phrase that Jesus used of the Father in heaven, Abba. So you begin to see how personal this prayer is. You get to see how intimate it is. We're not just going to see a king. We're not just going to see, not just to see the creator of the world. We're not just going to see the God above all gods. We're going to go and see dad. I remember being at a prayer meeting one time uh, up, um, I think it was in the Blackburn area. Uh, we were doing a mission up there. And I was, we, we, we joined the church for the church prayer meeting and at the very end of it we had a great time and at the very very end of it this guy went oh and I looked at him and said what's the matter he said oh he said I just felt like I've been I've gone into the throne room sat on my dad's lap and give him a big hug such intimate ways many people might think that's irreverent but what an intimate way to think of going close to dad we don't, we don't have to stand at a distance and fear him. Yes, in one sense, yes, because he is the holy God and he, we will stand before him as judge. But on the other hand, we approach him as dad. And we can go up to him. and We can sit on his lap on the throne and just give a hug. Our Father who art in heaven. I think it's very important that it's, it's that intimate phrase. Our Father who art in heaven being taken from the synagogue usage. So that beginning... Our Father who art in heaven was how they would have done it in the synagogue. The Jews did not call God the Father by Abba. That was that would have been irreverent to them. They used a whole different phrase. Um, but it was uh, it was Abba that Christ taught people to use. So in one sense, he's trying to get p- p- people away from this this hard, unapproachable God to this point where you can run up to God. You can 
boldly enter the throne room of the Father. You can run up and say, Dad, this is all my heart. That type of thing. So Christ in his day was going against the synagogue in the, in the words that were used to approach God the fa Father. So while the Jews were uh, a giving a picture of a God who hides behind a curtain in the Holy of Holies, a God who can only be, be, be approached one day a year with blood sacrifices, a God who, oh, awe and fear and terror and approaching God because you can be struck down dead. Christ is saying, God the Father is Abba. Come close. You know, that's why when he prays, he, he many times he says, Abba, I'm thankful that you've already heard me. And he's, already, and he's only started to pray. So it's that intimacy that, that, G, G, that G, Jesus wants to bring out. The use of this Aramaic Abba is an intimate and affectionate term. It, it was embedded in the first century Christian mind. You see this in Mark 14.36, and again, as I said, in Romans 8.15 and Galatians 4.6, 4, and would show the impact of, of the teaching of Jesus on the disciples and the first century Christians. The impact of Christ's teaching was not just about returning to the, the, the law the way it should be, not just grace and compassion, uh, a compassion and, and mercy. It wasn't just the cross. It wasn't just that he had come to seek and save the lost. But God was a God who wanted a personal relationship with you and with I. That's the teaching that he's bringing us back to. And there's only one way to get that personal relationship, and that's through the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, in, in and through me, you can have such an intimate relationship with God the Father. If you remember back to the, the first time I came here and we started this series, I posed a question, which didn't get a very clear answer. Can anybody pray? And I hope you've been thinking about that. To which my answer was yes and no. See, I, I don't believe that we do people at disservice. I believe in church we do people at disservice when we get them to come in who don't know God personally and we say, I'll just say the Lord's Prayer. We're getting them to pray to a God intimately that they do not know. So can anybody pray? I believe anybody can pray for forgiveness. I believe a non-Christian can pray and say, God, reveal yourself if you're there. I prayed that prayer before I became a Christian. If you are God and if you are there, then, and God turns up. I think we have to be careful on what we tell non-Christians to pray because I do not believe anybody can just pray anything because they're not part of the family. And please, don't think I'm being divisive. Listen, Scripture teaches you're in the family, you're not in the family. That's what Scripture teaches. And this prayer is an intimate prayer where I pray to my Father. I pray to the one who saved my life. I pray in intimate terms with God the Father. A non-Christian doesn't have that hope, but could have that hope in and through Christ. So I think we have to be careful as church how we get people to pray or what we get them to pray because this Lord's Prayer is an intimate affair, this one where we, we cry out to God who loves us. If rightly understood, we would see that the whole gospel is contained in one word. Abba. That's the gospel. That Christ came that we could have a relationship with God. That we can cry, Abba. That we can wake up in the morning and say, morning, Dad. Let's go. Now, that's the problem for us. And, here, and I will stress, I believe in here lies an issue that we, and I speak as a father, I speak here not just as someone who has had a father, but someone who is a father and such a someone within the fatherhood fails. Yes, I'm not a perfect dad. I know you'd be shocked to hear that. I don't believe anybody is a perfect dad. And therefore we as humans give a bad picture sometimes of what it is to be a father. But my father in heaven never lets me down. My father in heaven is always compassionate, always loving, always just, always fair, 
always holy and he's always there when I call on him. He's never too busy. He never lets me down. So please, I know that word father can have hang-ups on some of us. And as I say, for all you who have got issues with dads, I'm sorry because we're not perfect, you know. Um, but I'm, I don't want to glib over that. But we must understand that the gospel is, is could, if we could rightly understand it, is termed up in one word, Abba. Because Christ, because God is my father. I'm no longer an orphan. I'm no longer abandoned. I'm no longer cast out. I am welcomed in. I'm the prodigal who's come home and the, and the fattened calf's been killed. I am, I'm, I'm adopted into the family of God. And I, I, that's a wonderful picture. And it's all summed up in Abba. So when we pray our Father, we're actually declaring the gospel. We're actually declaring our relationship with God. We're actually declaring so, something that's so intimate that many times it would terrify us if we really got into the real intimacy of it. So it's a wonderful phrase, this Abba. So prayer, we're going to look at it in two ways. This in two ways. Prayer is a personal thing and prayer is a family affair. First of all, prayer is a personal thing. Matthew, here in Matthew and Luke, it appears that Jesus is introducing his disciples to the same intimate relationship that he enjoyed with the Father. It is, it is a personal thing. I am tired of hearing Christians, and please don't think I'm getting at you because I'm not. I'm tired of hearing Christians say they can't pray or somehow someone has spoken over them and said they shouldn't pray. Nobody has ever had the right to tell me I can't speak to my dad. No one. If I was walking around the streets of Belfast when my dad was alive and someone said, you don't have the right to speak to your dad, I would have told him where to go. I said, who do you think you are? You're, you mean, you're not part of the family, and even if you are, you can't tell me not to speak to my dad. So how, why are we in church the same? Why do we do the same? Why do we have, feel we have the right to say to certain people, oh, you shouldn't be praying that, or you shouldn't pray, or it's not your place to... We are family. It's a personal it's a personal relationship, and I will encourage each and every one of you, each and every one of you, to pray. Do you know one of the wonderful things I love about this concept? I came, I came, I came over a song. I came uh, to a song called "Overwhelmed" by an American group called Big Daddy Weave. If you've ever got a chance to hear it, listen to it. Absolutely wonderful. Overwhelmed. Do you know when I come before my father, I am so overwhelmed that he loves me that much. I am so over, I can't, some, sometimes I want to pray, but words just get stuck in my throat because you get so overwhelmed that the love and the passion and the spirit builds up. It's, a, it's an intimate, personal thing. And if you're not there, why aren't you there? Why aren't you there? You want to know the greatest thing that ever happened to me was just before I turned 16, in June 1982, I gave my life to the Lord. He could have let me be and he saved my soul. I'm overwhelmed. I can't thank God enough. I can't, I, I'm amazed at the fact that he took my sin on himself. There's nothing else he could, I could have given him. There's nothing else he could have taken. He took everything and died on the tree. The cross for me. And I should, you should be so overwhelmed at the fact that this is a personal thing. That he, he loves you that much. Do you know another, I just had a wonderful little picture in my mind. And as we were singing and also now, now, now up here. I, I, I think it's wonderful that the God who is outside of time and space. The God who inhabits eternity. Wants to break into time and space to spend time with you and with me. Now that should blow your mind. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. That the God who holds the galaxies, the world, time and space in the palm of his hand wants to break into it because he says, I want to spend time with you. What? That just, wow. That should, that should get us so intimate with a God who loves you that much and loves me that much that we want to draw close 
Look, he says, Father, I have a relationship. I have a relationship. It is, it is birthed out of, out of being adopted into the family. I have a relationship. That declaration. I. Not, not just we, but we'll get that in a minute, but it's I have a relationship. And if you don't know you have a relationship or you're struggling, you think, well, have I, haven't I? Or perhaps you feel like running away. Don't run out those doors until you speak to me. Because the best thing about this prayer, our Father who art in heaven or who is in heaven, is that I have that relationship and I can go to him night or day, night or day. And he's always there waiting on me. He doesn't say, why are you waking me up? Because he never, he, he never sleeps. He's always there when I call on him. He's wonderful. I have that relationship. I have been made a son or daughter of the living God. That's how personal this is. When you pray, say, pray these words. Father, Abba, just pray them. Get lost in the wonder of them. That's the personal, rela the personal relationship that you should have and I should have at the very outset of this prayer. Because if we don't get the personal relationship right, the rest of it won't work. If I don't have the personal relationship with Christ right, I'm not going to pray your will be done, not mine. I'll be too busy running after my own will. If I don't have the personal relationship right, I'm not going to pray forgive my debts as I've forgiven. I'm going to hold a grudge. I'm going to judge people. I'm going to... I'm going to gossip behind their back because I don't know what it's like. If I get the per personal relationship right, everything else falls into place or will stand a better chance of falling into place because my relationship with God is intimate and it's right and I'm, and I'm walking with him day by day. So it's a personal thing. But prayer is a family affair. See, we're never saved to be an island. No man is an island. Anybody ever remember that phrase? No man is an island. That was one of the wise words my mother used to say. No man's an island. You're not an island. You need... And then she'd give me some other words, words of advice. My, my mother's very wise, she is. But we must assume that the prayer is not just about you. We need to assume that this prayer is also about us. You see, you are saved to be part of a family. Whether you like it or not, tough, okay? Scripture says you're saved to be part of a family, part of a body. You are part of a body, but even if you want it or not. The fact is, too many times I've come across Christians who are trying to, be, who are trying to isolate themselves from the body, and they weaken their faith. They weaken themselves. They weaken the witness because we are saved individually, but also there's that corporate element we are saved to be part of a body and so we must understand that this corporate element of the our father okay it's he's our father and when i say part of a body part of a uh, um, a family i'm not just talking about us here or four street down in down in st ives i'm talking about the church okay the church as we know is the people it's not the buildings so when i talk about us i'm talking about the church in general we are saved to be church, okay? The buildings are great, and we love the buildings, and we, and we all want to be, be in them and be together, but we're saved as that corporate ele element. The, the introductory words of the prayer also remind us of the fact that all Christian believers are one in Him, for we are to pray to Him as our Father. We are one. Now, that might make you uncomfortable. If it is, you take it up with God. No, please don't take it up with me. It's his, I mean, it's his prayer he taught. It's his want. It's his will. It's what he wants. We are one in him. That's why we pray our Father, one in heart, one in purpose, one in spirit, one in mind, one in mission and vision that the glory of God will be seen, that people will look at us and go, I want what you have. One. We are saved to be one in him. In addressing him as our father, we look up to him uh, in love and faith as one who is near. 
one who is near, near us in, per, per, in perfect love and grace. That's what we do. One of the, one of the saddest things you, you will ever hear in a church is this. We don't do it that way. We don't, or as they would say, we don't belong to do. We are church. We are God's body. We come to Abba, our Father, in intimate terms. And if he says, go and do, we can't go, oh God, no, we, just, we just don't do it, do, do it that way. We must understand we are to be one of heart, one of purpose, one of spirit, one of mind with God our Father. And we will move out in his name, in his power for his glory. That's why this is so important. The understanding that we are church. We are one in him. He, Jesus, does not appear to ever have used the expression. Christ never seemed to have used that our Father, because we are, we are one in Him, in that sense, in such a way as to include His disciples with Himself. Nor is there any hint that He ever felt the need to ask for forgiveness for Himself. That's why I believe this is the disciples' prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer, because He never had to say, forgive me my debts as I forgive also my debtors, because He was the only true perfect man. So again, we, 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 the name that we use is a bit of a misunderstanding. He taught us how to live the life and pray the life that he lived and modeled before us. So where is dad from? Time is going and I want to just bring this in. Who, where is dad from? That's easy to say. Heaven. Our father who is in heaven. Heaven, but that again is an expression that we are so familiar with and we lose the wonder of that. That phrase, who art in heaven, is a Jewish expression which is found 20 times in Matthew as an epitaph of Father God. In Matthew, the most, the most Jewish of all the Gospels, written to the Jewish people, when they talked about Father God, they always said, who is in heaven? It was a, it was, it was, it sort of rolled off the tongue. It was what happened. By the opening words of the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, we are taught the correct attitude and spirit in which we should pray to God. God is not like one of us. Okay? He is not like one of us. He became like one of us, but He is not like one of us. We don't come to a God with. Failings, weaknesses, good days, bad days, falling out with people. We come to a God who is holy. We come to a God who is just. We come to a God who is merciful and gracious. We come to a God that, that defies description from time to time. He is in heaven. To use a... a a type of phrase, we say he's transcendent. He's far and above anything that we know. Far, he's transcendent. He's in heaven. He's almighty. He's all powerful. He knows everything. He, he is king of kings and lord of lords from generation to generation. His kingdom lasts. There's not a time that is ever going to come to an end. Wow, he's in heaven. You, you get the feeling? You get the idea of where this is going? Our God is above everything. He's outside of time and space. See, for me, heaven is not just up there. You know, like we were always taught, heaven's up there and hell's down there. It's not, it's not like, for me, heaven is outside of time and space. Heaven is where God is. Heaven is that time, where, is that place that he inhabits. He is in heaven transcendent, high, far and above anything that we can think or think or imagine. The words put God in his correct place. The old phrase goes that God, that God created man in his image and we've been trying to repay the favor ever since. We always try and bring God down to our level. 
Because in bringing God down to our level, he's manageable. He's debatable. We can disagree with him because we've brought him down to our level. Where this prayer puts God where he rightly belongs. Far and above us. He's transcendent. He's in heaven. He's, we can't debate with him. We can't correct him. We can't say he's wrong. He is our father in heaven. But you want to know what that means as well for me? That means that I have such a father who draws close to me in intimate ways. Can you picture that? That for every Christian who draws close to God in an intimate way, such deep relational ways, we have the God of heaven on our side. Wow! The God of heaven on our side. And if that doesn't rock your boat, I don't know what will. If that doesn't get you singing, I don't know what will. I was, I was out for a meal the other night. It was really interesting. I was out for a meal the other night. We were, it, it was a bit of a murder mystery. Um, and we were all there. And I, one of the, one of my con- some of my congregation were there. And one of them went up, oh, i got bad ear, eardrum. And the next minute I was there and just, let's, let's just pray. Let's bring it to dad. And I was off and we were in the middle of this meal. And everybody was going, what are they doing? Oh, we're just praying. Don't worry about it. I don't care where I am. I want to see the, tran- the transcendent, all-powerful God step into where I am because he's my dad and reveal who he is. Our father who art in heaven. It's not just a nice way to start off something. Or, you know, we don't know how to start it, so we'll go, oh, our Father in heaven. This is a declaration of of intimacy. This is a declaration of relationship. This is a declaration of not just personal, but corporate identity and corporate relationship with God and with one another. And this 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 is putting God back on the throne and saying, you are God. You are transcendent. You are all powerful and yet you let me call you dad. There's that imminent and that transcendent aspect of God in this prayer at the very beginning. So to say that this prayer is overused can be, could be said, but I believe once you fully grasp the words that you speak, you never say it the same ever again. You cannot say it the same ever again. The intimate relational approach and understanding of God was was unknown in the Old Testament.